Uh, thanks, and I want to welcome the rest of the panelists to come up as well. And um, we're going to do a little uh, changing of the environment because we're hoping to have a conversation this afternoon that makes the topic of incarceration uh, accessible and to uh, uh, look something at its uh, long history, interdisciplinary activities, and furthermore to uh, understand something about its uh, dramatic harms and how it can be radically altered, if not ended. I do want, before, as we're setting space, um, and people will get introduced and organized, um, first of all, actually, Bree Williams, our other panelist, had COVID. Ha so we are, she is not, she is here on Zoom, and not Dr. Williams, and not in person, because we're still living in an age of COVID. Um, this is my 20th year, holy moly, and I am incredibly grateful for being able to be a participant and have learned so much. And I just want to say a special thank you to Linda, who has been a transformative generative force in APS, which looks very different from when I joined it. Um, and it's wonderful to see the diversities of schools and disciplines and peoples come together in this serious conversation. Obviously, an enormous thank you to the library. It is the repository of Eastern Penitentiary materials, and we saw last night on display some of us, some of the ledger, sad ledger books that you can see along with the other amazing things. And Annie Westcott and at all have been tireless in the logistics of this, which is a slightly more challenging uh, activity because the hope is that we will also be. Um, getting to glimpse what a facility looked like and how it looks more or less like some other facilities that uh, will be discussed. So that's all by way of preview. And our plan, actually, I, let's be clear about our plan. Um, we're each going to talk for about 15 minutes with some breaks for time for questions. And there's breaks as well at the break. And then, um, uh, so we will hopefully help you see the transnational threads of this conversation. But when I say transnational, it's actually Europe and the United States. This is not an account of incarceration in all parts of the world, just to be clear about the subject matter. And um, uh, my uh, hope is to be both previewing and introducing while also telling you a little bit more about the topic. So. Uh, I just hit a button, but I didn't, I just hit this button, but nothing changed yet. I, unless some, I think I just zoom. I, I'm hoping that I'll show you a PowerPoint, but I didn't do it right. Oh, you see it now, you know, the next one. Now I need to, yeah. Slight technical pause. Um, I can do something else. I can touch it with a, a different button. No. Nope. We're in a. So actually, I was going to introduce everybody when they speak, but here we are now, and they're on the stage. And if we're still, ah, whoops, we'll. So Elizabeth Hinton, you just met. Bernard Harcourt is a remarkable person who is both a translator of Foucault and a death penalty lawyer, and he teaches at Columbia. You have all their bio, so I'm doing incredibly brief introductions while we fix our technology. And so is a remarkable, he writes about the praxis and theory, and he inhab inhabits it as he teaches at Rikers Island, among other, as well as at Columbia. Um, Judge Myron Thompson is an amazing presence that the United States is lucky. He. Um, comes from Alabama. I've heard him advise the student body graduating from Yale Law School to go home to their homes, which he did. If you read the website, one website tells you that Alabama had never employed in its government a black person as anything other than a teacher or a janitor until he became the first to be in the assistant attorney general's office of the state after graduating from Yale Law School. And he then went on, has gone on to be a judge. And anybody who thinks about voting or abortion or schools or um, 
uh, prisons or many other things will have read his lower court decisions that are shorthands for all of us and guideposts for all of us. Andrea Armstrong, who, also, who is, uh, is at Loyola, New Orleans, she was profiled in The New Yorker uh, for her amazing work in, in looking at which a transparency project focused on the numbers of people who die in Louisiana prisons and enabling clarity or insight or vision or a peak, depending on the, what she is able to do with a group of students to excavate that information um, and uh, has made a dent in Louisiana and just testified in the Senate uh, this September about something, this thing called the Death and Custody Act that needs revision because there's a lot of death in custody. And Dwayne Betts is a, um, I'm, I get to say that you were a Lyman Fellow, which I'm very delighted. Uh, you're a MacArthur Fellow now, and is a poet and a lawyer and an activist who is central to a project called Freedom Reads. And on the screen to be Dr. Bree Williams, who's a physician, who I first met by listening to her at a conference as she explained that um, in prisons that are double bunked, she's a gerontologist, and if you have trouble, as some of us may do, moving, you can't bend to get into the first bunk, and you can't climb to get into the second bunk, and therefore you can't sleep. So she has dealt with the questions of health in incarceration and the public health implications for many years, and she also has created something called the MEND, which looks at those issues in the context of the staff, because working in prisons is really bad for your health, as well as being in them, as well as, of course, the communities around them. So um, this is this is a port. This comes as a folio from a very fancy volume in which Amsterdam's population is actually receding at the time and people are advertising Amsterdam. And there are 100 pictures, prints, of which a fifth are about houses of confinement, orphans, poor people, widows, whoever you are, and this is the men's house of corrections, proudly advertised in this come to Amsterdam, we got control going here, uh, in 1783 in a folio um, that um, is uh, uh, telling you this is the largest building of its era built in the city at the time, which is apt in its radical over-incarceration of people for all forms of detention. And on the next scene, thank you, from Bernard, is the color version. I had a black and white. This is the men's house of correction again, your interior. And this proud folio is showing you how they whip people with spectators watching. And of course, the point is to underscore that it's clean and it's controlled and we're making you do menial work and you're going to get reformed maybe, but if not, we've got a strong grip on you. Now, the... So this is the valorization of the act of incarceration, but within the time of when prisons are birthed, if you will, uh, in the 17 and 1800s, and there's a, actually 1600s, England and Amsterdam vie for who had the first, um, there's also a starting to be the birth of critique. And learned societies, philanthropists, religious groups very centrally go into the process of worrying. And here you have the captive, a print by Thomas Ryder. And he's depicting a French prison, by the way. So this is the English dissing the French in saying that look at this terrible oppression with this saintly figure chat fettered along the way. And the point, of course, to underscore is that at the time, as you heard from this morning's talk on de Tocqueville, prisons are seen as the great advance and reform because you were going to be executed, branded, put in public stocks, or transported to colonies for the imperial powers. And yes, in fact, Gustave de Beaumont and Alexis de Tocqueville come here and look at the facility we look at, and so does uh, John Howard is an obsessive map maker chronological, uh, 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 con uh, trying to categorize all the facilities in England and Europe. This is social science at its birth. So for our learned society, these people are birthing sociology. 
and they are actually part of and become part of societies that do it. And they are also starting as political theorists to put the practice of punishment on the map of political theory as they engage in trying to understand what it is that governments can and cannot do. And one of the most famous, Beccaria, is a, um, a Dutch, I mean, not sorry, it's translated into Dutch and many other places, in Italian, Marquis de, who actually writes anonymously because he's afraid he's going to be in prison because he develops a theory of the limits of what it is that the state can do in terms of modes of punishment. And as a person with affection for frontispieces and iconography, this is his famous frontispiece of a justice image rejecting the severed halves that are being there because he is famous in the United States for questioning the death penalty. And he has, and this is just a snippet of his important monograph, which I believe there is a copy at the library here, uh, punishment had to be public, prompt, necessary, the least possible in the given circumstances, proportionate to the crimes dictated by law. So it sounds like you might want to hug him, and he's certainly used and waved as an emblem of proportionality in many conversations. But let's get clear, which is that he thought that instead of execution, Penal servitude, fetters, change, rod, yoke, cage, all in. And so this is the one key point to understand about punishment practices, is we're always operating with a baseline. And when the baseline is execution, maybe that stuff looks OK. But we have to think about what is OK now or not. Jeremy Bentham, of course, an enormously important figure in this field, was an abolitionist about um, transportation. So mostly you'll find somebody who's an abolitionist about don't do that, but here it is. And of course, Bentham is famous for scripting the panopticon, which he wanted, sorry, dissent from Foucault. He wanted to be very clear as a deterrent because he was totally clear he wanted to scare you into not behaving that way. So his prisons were not closed and hard to find, but he, he never built, but there was a watchtower so people could see. I just want to fast forward, and I'm now in United States constitutional law. And what we inherited from these Enlightenment folks is an idea that was embraced that punishment is not supposed to be random. It's not supposed to be just terrorizing. It's supposed to be something called purposeful. And you can find dozens of references to penological justification and licit purposes. And I've given you on the screen the list of what is often invoked, which is incapacitation, retribution, deterrence, rehabilitation, reformation sometimes called, institutional safety and cost reduction. So immediately any of you can see, contradictory, capacious, can license a ton of stuff, what form of constraint. You can also see that it can justify a great deal. It, and it can also doesn't. It's all pre-democratic. This is an ideology we've inherited from the Enlightenment without any recognition of us as e of all of us as equal. And so it is incomplete in that it doesn't talk at all about the importance of equality, even and nor about how democratic decision-making about punishment needs to distinguish itself from non-democratic, totalitarian, in fact. So the next is to just, of course, show you that you can't have the punishment structure we live in today without a political economy of an infrastructure. And this is a marker in Ohio, because Rutherford B. Hayes, in 1870, before he became president, welcomed the first ever National Correctional Conference, which is this development of specialties and professionalization of corrections, of sociology, of criminology, psychology, psychiatry. We'll all be in there as we get there. And this... U.S. Congress begetted something that became an American Correctional Association and also helped to spawn, with Russian input from a Russian Moscow prison leader, the International Penal Penitentiary Commission, which began in 1872 in London and ran till 1951. And this was one of the first geopolitical bureaucracies where nation states joined together to discuss and deal with prisons and held conferences and fancy mostly European uh, capitals and were greeted by princes in their, and princesses in palaces or queens and kings and developed discussions about what kinds of punishment was okay and what kind of punishment wasn't okay for people who were in prison. And now I'm just giving you a, 15, a 1902 prison in England to show you that amidst all this 
pompous professionalization and discussion. This is, they called it a treadwheel wheel and mindless seven steps running around making all these people do terribly painful things for hours on end as we're talking about a march for progress that, of course, World War I crashes. And in 1925, this group reconvenes in London for its first conference. And there, and now I get to inject some gender diversity in the story, um, and before then, we, all the prison people are all white men. Uh, but there are some women doing children's things and juveniles. But here is Marjorie Fry, Bloomsbury, Roger Fry. And she um, was part of the Howard League in England, which was a reform organization. And in the 1925, six, seven, she's the first person I can find who says rights, prison is torture, and these people have rights, and we need a convention to limit the way the state can treat them. Now, the boys of the International Penal Penitentiary Commission kind of poo-poo the women of the Howard League. But these women are astonishing. They go to Geneva, where the League of Nations is, and in Geneva, they uh, lobby the League of Nations and the International Penal Penitentiary Commission people say, we better get our acts together, and they draft the standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners that in 1934 is adopted by the League of Nations. And I'm going to pause to just show you, because this is one way to understand incarceration circa the 1930s by people who think they're doing good things. First of all, it's humanitarian and social point of view. Zero rights are in the story. Second of all, the admonition, give them enough food, tells you that they didn't have food and water in many places. Third of all, in certain countries for exceptional cases, corporal punishment is permitted. It should be determined by law, get law and docs in and the medicine uh, certify, and if a dark cell is permitted, also regulated. So here, is, and this is, by the way, negotiated. I have all these archives from the UN, some of it in French, um, that is negotiated because the English and the Commonwealth is big into flogging, whereas Argentina and Romania think it's not good, while the French don't like flogging, they're all into chains. So you can see the idea of how do you, when you take someone and you incarcerate them, what is the treatment that you're going to do if you are going to incarcerate them. And I want to show you another frontispiece because I'm interested in the imagery of this. And these are these, this is promulgated, this is distributed by the Home Office. It's a little print and you can't see it's 1936. In 1935, these people meet in Berlin over the objections of Marjorie Fry and the Howard League and some American Jews who say, thank you, I'm not coming. Um, and the Nazis put on a big display about how they do their criminal work. Footnote, actually, Germany was a liberal uh, state on punishment in the 1910s and 20s. When you are thinking of the human beings you incarcerate as not bearing rights, totalitarian fascists and people thinking of themselves as democratic or not, can all talk together because they're managing prison populations rather than trying to improve. Now, of course, World War II in the eruption ends the International Penal Penitentiary Commission and the civil rights movement here. And so now I'm in 1955 at the UN and look at how the rules have changed. While they've used the template of this earlier organization, they now talk about non-discrimination on a basis of a bunch of things. And they more often, they actually use the word Imprisonment is afflictive by the very fact of taking from the person the right of self-determination by depriving him of his liberty. Sounds good, then get to the next sentence. The prison system shall not accept as incidental to justifiable segregation or the maintenance of discipline, aggravate the suffering inherent in the situation. That's where all the action is. That's where the action is, is what can you do and what can't you do? And so now moving on, they say no corporal punishment should be completely prohibited. But close confinement, let's call it solitary confinement, and restrictor diet, we call it bread and water, are still permissible as long as the docs say it's okay. So now I just want to be in the United States, and now here we're entering the civil rights movement, and this is a man. There's a lawsuit named Washington v. Lee. It's not the George who's on our wall, and it's not Robert E., but of course the name was chosen just for that, because... Caleb Washington was the lead plaintiff depicted here and frankly was the head of the Alabama prison system at the time. And Alabama had a statute that said that black and white people could not be chained together or sleep together, i.e. de jure, by law, segregation, by race. And a great district judge in whose courtroom Judge Thompson sits, Judge Johnson, held on behalf of three judges, that was unconstitutional, and it went to the Supreme Court in 1967. 
And so here we are in the Supreme Court in, in the fall of 1967, and Alabama says to the U.S. Supreme Court, this is the question, a person who serves a penitentiary sentence has no right to make a claim for desegregation. And I just wanted to be clear that it, we're in 67, and the chutzpah of the state of Alabama who can say, while we agree we have to desegregate our schools, we don't, these people don't have the authority to challenge us to desegregate our prisons. And uh, they're talking to a bench in which, for the first time, there's a black man sitting there because it's Thurgood Marshall's first fall on the court. And the court upholds the desegregation order. But justices Black, Harlan, and Stewart add in 1968 that prison authorities have the right, in good faith and circumstances, to take into account racial tensions in maintaining security, discipline, and good order in prisons and jails. So the mantra of security, discipline, and good order, about which you'll hear a lot, about the lack of order in prisons, is reiterated in every one of these documents. Now come to another guy who's not famous at all, named Winston Taylor, but I'm working on it. And he's a handwritten, you can't read it, it's a hand-filed thing that says, stop the whip because at this point, Arkansas officially whips people as it's dissident. And he writes eighth, Article 8, he's, he's invoking the US Constitution, and he is saying, yes, state, you can punish me, but you can't whip me. And three federal district judges say, you can. First of all, they say he can get into court. Second, they give him great Arkansas lawyers. And third, they say, yes, you can whip under the cruel and unusual clause, as long as you do it in a non-arbitrary fashion and not more than 10 whips at a time, 10 lashes at a time. So this is the result, and here's the group of the people who testified in Arkansas, who, obviously, I'm showing you this picture because they are white men, as white and black men were whipped into this system. And here is the whip. And so, and this is again contra Foucault. It's, this is the Arkansas newspaper, shout out to the press. The Arkansas Democrat, the Arkansas Gazette, tell us the story day by day, and you can hear grotesque things about the prisons on the front pages of those papers if you read from 60 to basically 2010, when it kind of fades out as, a, as papers with great detail. But some remain. So this is the whip. And finally, in a great breakthrough, then Judge Harry Blackman, who becomes Justice Harry Blackman in a book that Linda has uh, happily given us a great insight into, uh, says, actually, you can't whip them. It's cruel and unusual. He also raises the best, he puts, if whipping is impermissible, what else is? And so again, the question is, how do you punish? And of course, I've given you pictures of men in Arkansas who, as far as I can tell from their social histories, are not understanding themselves as part of political movements. But of course, and as you'll hear much more about, there are political movements. And so this is a flash at Attica, 1971. Um, and the uprising there, there are amazing networks of prisoners, some affiliated with the Muslim uh, nation and some with the uh, nation of Islam, and some unaffiliated who are involved in in reconfiguration, and because we're also going to talk about Louisiana, I just gave you a snippet of a court of appeals decision that says, of course, we have to protect prisoners' constitutional rights. We're all in because, of course, the Constitution is there, and Angola, Louisiana has to be dealt, has to be has to accord treatment that is constitutionally licit. So one version of this question, and I'm not trying to be court-centric because I'm also legislatures, executive, and it's politics all the way up and down, inter and it's political economic infrastructure. So for, there's a brief period of time when there's proposed legislation, model statutes, state and federal, and a host of other things trying to say, stop debilitating people. And then the U.S. Supreme Court, as electoral politics that you'll hear more about, issues an opinion in 1981, licensing that you can put two people in a place of a cell built for one person, and you hear the tests of what's cruel and unusual, wanton and unnecessary infliction of pain, grossly disproportionate, minimum civilized measures, civilization of life's necessity. Civilization runs through this whole story at great length. But of course, people convicted of crimes can't be free of discomfort, and it's not up to us as rights folks. And I want to be clear that every of my examples comes from all over the United States, because this is so not a Southern Belt story. So you may have Arkansas, and you have Louisiana, but you also have Ohio, and here's the California prison system in 2008 with radical overcrowding as well. 
And now I need to give you a glimpse of something called solitary confinement, which is this is the description provided by the US Supreme Court, where people are in places seven by 14 feet, 23 hours a day, light on all the time, no sensory uh, possibilities at all. And so here, and you could pick up the most recent version of some data that we at the Lauriman Center have collected called Time and Cell. This is just to show you that we're looking at a lot of people, that at the time there are about 1.5 million people in prison, and the range is from hardly anybody to 28% of your population in solitary confinement, 30 or 20, 15 days or more, 22 hours or more. And there are some people in there for six years or more, or 20 or 30 years or more as well. And in short order, we'll be able to give you a website to give you more of this data. But the point and the discussion to come is to ask, what, is it, what does it mean if you call yourself democracy to punish people? And how is it, that what authorizes it, what forms of punishment are licit, and what forms are not licit? And one of the other things, Jeremy Bentham's brilliant in this, Jeremy Bentham says, talks about a principle of less eligibility. He's worried, he thinks all, all the people in prison are poor, and if we make prisons too good, then poor people might want to get into them. But he also says we've got to feed him because we don't have any authority to kill him, and the whole idea is not to kill them. So he has this idea of a minimum set of services. But what he also identifies is the question. In a world in which you don't give social services to people on the streets, and you must give social services to prisoners, there is the begrudging, that's his word, of giving, while some other people see the lack of it as a lack of humanity. So you can think about it in political moral terms, you can think about it in legal terms, you can think about it in many instances. And to close the other bookend, Faith Ringel, the great American artist, has what she calls the United States of Attica, and she has inscribed in small print both institutions of detention and um, incarceration, as well as of many of violence. Now at the bottom, you may or may not be able to see but the bottom ledger says, this map of American violence is incomplete. Please write in whatever you find lacking. And I am ending here because this is the introduction to everybody else on the podium. And we'll start with Andrea Armstrong, who is telling us specifically a good deal more about the violence we can find within. And 2.3 more times more likely to be murdered in prison than on the streets is the last data available. So welcome to the world of prison.